everyone. Hello, everybody. Cole here from Aggressor Adventures. I hope everyone's having a great Thursday. Uh, welcome to our Zoom into Adventure series. Today is episode eight with Samantha Whitcraft, conservation biologist. Uh, before I hand it over to Samantha, let me give you a quick little background here. We've got three trying to get in. Let's see. All right, so Samantha's Director of Conservation and Outreach for Aggressor Adventures and Sea of Change Foundation with the mission to create positive change for our natural world. Samantha's work includes developing Green the Fleet, sustainab uh, sustainability initiatives for aggressors operations. A Harvard graduate with 20 years diving experience, Whitcraft has taught at Miami-Dade College and University of Hawaii on the subjects of traditional ec ecological knowledge of coral reef ecosystems. An avid photographer and published nature writer, she is also a Platinum Pro 5000 diver, recognized by the scuba diving industry as an elite water explorer. Okay, how are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing great, thanks, Cole. So nice to see everybody here. Yeah, very excited for your uh, presentation today. So uh, why don't you give us a little bit of history on you, a little background on you. Okay, um, well, I'll go over, I'm not used to talking about me, I'm used to talking about corals and fishes. So um, I grew up in uh, Europe, actually, and the first place I ever snorkeled was in the Mediterranean when I was five years old. Um, there's pictures of me with like a little tiny mask this big and the, like a little tiny snorkel. And um, once I was put in the water, I, they just could never get me out again, really, for the rest of my life. Um, I started diving um, during a college internship uh, at the New England Aquarium. The, uh, the team that I was interning with was the Penguin Husbandry team, which at the time was also the dive team for cleaning the giant ocean tank. So. I got trained as a, a diver um, as part of my internship with the New England Aquarium. And then my very first job after um, finishing my degree in Boston was a research diver at Caribbean Marine Research Center with Oregon State University. And that's where I fell in love with reef fish because we um, spent all summer collecting little tiny blue damsels off the reef and then elastomer tagging them, which is basically like giving fish a little tattoo underwater, it's very difficult. <laughs> and then releasing them back onto the reef and then counting how many were there that we had tagged. And so there was a whole reef that was basically mine and my responsibility for the whole summer. So I knew every little nook and cranny and every fish. And um, so that, that started me on, on the path of loving that. And then, um, since then, I've had a varied career in marine conservation, working for wonderful organizations and working with wonderful organizations um, like uh, Shark Savers and Wild Aid, National Geographic, um, the University of Miami, NOAA. And I started with Aggressor three and a half years ago, uh, helping them, as Cole said, both with sustainable operations and with heading up the Sea of Change Foundation. Um, and it's been a blessing. It's a wonderful company and a wonderful opportunity. Okay. Well, great. Uh, will you, are you ready to go ahead and start your presentation? I am. All right. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and uh, we'll ask you some questions throughout, all right? And I just go to share my screen and my presentation, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stay on until you get it up. And I hit the share screen button, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, the green one there at the bottom. Yeah, I thought I did that. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Okay, can you see that, my title? Yeah. yeah it Does looks it say good. the ish of fish for you? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so this presentation is called the ish of fish um, because uh, when I first started learning ichthyology um, from a professor, I remember um, I was learning it in the field, actually. And I remember showing him this book because we were doing research in, in, the, uh, in the Caribbean. And I said, do you know every single fish in here? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, ish. I said, well, what do you mean? You either know them or you don't. And he said, no, it's not like that. If you get to understand where fish are and how they behave and um, where they are in the ecosystem, then even if you don't know a specific fish, you can know a lot about that fish, which will help you 
to understand what it is, even if you don't know the exact name. So that's where it comes from. And also from the fact that I did spend a, the first half of my career learning the fish of the Caribbean, and then all of a sudden found myself in the Pacific, uh, in places like Raja Ampat and Fiji and Palau, where it's like being Alice in Wonderland. All the fish you thought you knew look slightly familiar, but it's not the fish you know. So, um, so this is a, sort of a guide of how to get to know fish without having to learn every single species by knowing some good questions to ask. Okay, so um, this is me with my favorite tiger shark. Um, obviously, I also fell madly in love with sharks. But I've been in love with fish, as I said, since I first started doing research on them in the Caribbean. And I also, with Shark Savers, uh, was fortunate enough to help start the world's first citizen science national count of sharks in uh, Fiji. So uh, I like to apply citizen science to my understanding of fish also. Okay, so some of the tip, tips and tricks for knowing and understanding fish are to, when you see a fish for the first time or you have a little, a little extra time to watch a fish that you haven't had a chance to really watch before, is to ask questions like these three. What shape is it versus what color? And we'll talk a little bit about why in a minute. Where it is, in other words, what habitat are you seeing that fish in? And that can be as small as a little patch of sand on the reef itself, or as broad as the reef crest versus the seagrass flats. And then what is it doing and why, or behavior? Because the behavior of a fish can tell you a lot about what that fish is and what its place is in that ecosystem or on the coral reef. So why do we ask what shape it is versus what color it is? Well, the first reason is because fish change colors. And you may have seen this in action, or if you haven't and you look more closely, you may see it happen in action. So um, the best example that I could find is you can see here this picture of the schoolmaster snapper with the red pointer pointing at its, that bar through its eyes called a feeding bar. And it isn't always there. Gray snappers and schoolmaster snappers will flash that bar when either they're feeling territorial or they're about to hunt or feed. And sometimes that bar isn't there at all. And also those stripes on the schoolmaster snapper, those bars, those white bars, those can come on stronger or lighter, making that fish look a little different too. And then um, the other fish is a juvenile gray angel. And if you know gray angels, they don't look anywhere near that beautiful when they're adults. So that can make it hard to identify a fish by color. And then this um, sailfin tang here, the shape of the tang stays the same, as does the shape of the angelfish and the snapper, although the colors change. The sailfin tang, as an adult, has a bright yellow tail and not as much yellow on the body. And then chubs are notorious for occasionally having one bright yellow chub, but it's still the same species of chub, or some of the chubs will bring on spots when they're excited or feeding or something. And spotted chubs are not a different species than regular chubs. They just are changing the look of themselves because of the behavior. Um, so identifying fish by color. And then of course, there's the example of parrotfish, as you all know, the, they have different phases as they get to the terminal male. And so, Parrotfish at different phases of their life can look completely different. So trying to identify them by, the, by color can be problematic. But fish shapes tend to be pretty consistent. And that's why, and a lot of people don't know this or use it, but if you have this book, which I highly recommend, at the beginning, you'll see that a lot of the fish are, I can't make it there, a lot of the fish are listed by their shape so that you can look them up by shape because shape is one of the most telling characteristics of a fish above color. So that's very helpful. Um, the other reason is that, as I just showed you, it's easier to reference a fish in most guidebooks by shape. So we wanna look at fish shapes more than we wanna look at fish colors when we're trying to determine what a fish is. So the other thing is that I think you, you 
already, if you dive quite a bit, you're already used to looking and recognizing shapes. Like, you know what a shark shape is, you know what a ray shape is. It's just a question of fine tuning so that you can recognize those kinds of shapes in other fishes too, that aren't quite as dramatic as sharks. So what you see there is a forceps butterfly, otherwise also known as a long nose butterfly. And that's a very distinctive shape for that fish. And the shape of fish also tell you, can tell you a lot about how that fish behaves and what it does. So that forceps butterfly has that shaped nose because it's a coralivore. It eats coral polyps and that's why it has that long snout. It actually uses it to pull out individual coral polyps that it feeds on. And sharks, of course, are built for speed and built for, um, for being predators. So understanding how a fish is built and how it moves can tell you a lot about that animal too. And that has to do with shape much more than color. So as we were talking about in the previous slide, mouth shape is really a, a, a good indicator of what a fish is all about and can help you identify a fish. So an example is the barbels on fish. So those little whiskers that hang down, especially on goat fish and on nurse sharks and also on catfish, those are only found on fish that use them to feed in the sand. They use them as little sensors to dig around in the sand and find what they're feeding on. So um, I found that particularly helpful the first time I went to Raja Ampat, the center of uh, fish biodiversity, because I was used to the Caribbean where there's a handful of, if that, goatfish. And I get to Raja Ampat and I met with this. It's like three pages of goatfish. So um, if, you, if you're familiar with the shape of a goatfish and you know to look for those barbels, then you're home free. You may not know the exact species, but if you see it swimming by, even if it's not down in the sand, like in this picture, but a few of them have their barbels hanging down, then you're like, okay, that's a goat fish. I'm home free. I just ID that fish. Um, so understanding the mouth of a fish can tell you a lot. And another example of that would be stargazers, for example. Their mouths are very ventral up at the top of their head. And that's because they're ambush predators. And you'll find that that mouth placement is very common in ambush predators. And same with parrotfish. Parrotfish have those um, parrot-like um, beaks, and that's used for crushing um, coral to get the algae in the coral. So the other place that's habitat that a lot of people don't necessarily think of is where in the water column. So habitat isn't just down on the reef or down in the sand or down in the seagrass or up in the mangroves. The striation of the water column also represents habitat and tells you something about the fish and what those fish are doing and where they are in it. So for example, in this picture, these horse eye jack, and also there is one uh, yellowtail snapper in there. Um, they are up high in the water column underneath the dive boat um, near Tiger Beach because they are exhibiting schooling and predator avoidance. So they're up high because the predator's down low and that's how they're, that's how they're using their habitats. And jacks, you'll often find jacks and other pelagics or open ocean fish high up above the reef um, rather than down low on it. And that's because they're more accustomed to being in the open bluer water, but they will be reef associated. So then um, another thing to think about is where fish are in relation to the reef. So um, when you first dive in some of the places that have massive fish abundance and, and high, high biodiversity, um, like uh, Raja Ampat or Palau, especially Raja Ampat, um, there are so many small, colorful fish up above the coral that even if you're a total fish geek like me, it can become really overwhelming <laughs> to try and understand what it is that you're looking at. So um, one of the ways that you can uh, do that is to understand that when fish are like in this uh, picture here, the one that's further back in the slide, uh, those are chromis. And chromis are a kind of damselfish. And chromis tend to hang out just above the coral, not way, way high up. 
above the coral, but just above the coral. And they're all facing in the same direction because they're, they're uh, planktivores. So they're in the water stream waiting for little bits of plankton to come. And you can tell that too, because they have little teeny tiny terminal mouths because they eat little teeny tiny plankton. And so they're up above the coral feeding on the plankton. And then you can see down in the coral, there are some other yellow damselfish and they're um, probably uh, more grazers. And so they're further down in the coral looking for algae to graze on, but they're damselfish too. And then in and amongst the damselfish in places like Raja Ampat, you'll also see, um, uh, oh, it just went right out of my head. I got it. Wait, it's right here. Antheus. Sorry, just totally blank. Antheus. And at first, when you first see Antheus and Chromis all mixed in together, it's kind of like, oh, it's beautiful, but how do I know what's what? Well, one of the ways that you can tell is that Chromis have a very scissored tail, very distinct scissored tail, whereas Antheus tend to have a, a wispy tail, but the but it isn't scissored. There's that filled in space between the upper lobe and the lower lobe. And also chromis are much more oval and antheus are much more elongated. So once you start to see those fine differences, even when they're all mixed in together, and when there's multiple color chromis, which can happen, you can have yellow and green and blue chromis all together, and then different colored antheus all mixed in, you can still often tell them apart um, without having to know color by the shape of the tail. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Hi, Dad. I'm on, I'm on with about 50 people giving a presentation. Okay, sorry. I didn't know what he was doing wrong. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll take him away. Okay, thank you. I'll take him home. All right. My dad's yeah. checking on my puppy. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Hey, Samantha, we've got a first question coming in. Uh, one, sure. One, Hold on uh, just a second. It's okay. Can you take him? Yeah. Hi. Mm. Sorry. Go ahead. One person wants to know the uh, title of the book that you were referring to earlier. Oh, okay. There's two books. That's a really good question because I highly recommend both these books. One is easy to get. The other one isn't. I'm sorry. So the first one is. Um, it's a uh, reef fish identification, Flora, Caribbean, and Bahamas by Human, um, Paul Human, and uh, Ned Deloach. And it looks like this. It's probably the most popular, um, the most popular reef fish identification book. This one is for the Caribbean. There is one for the Pacific too. The only downside to this book is that it's big and it's heavy. Um, but it's really good for beginners because you can look up the fish by those shapes, which is super helpful because one of the things I was going to show you in this other book is that if you're out diving and you remember, oh, I saw a black and white fish and you come back and you didn't look at where it was, what it was doing and what shape it was, you know, was it one of those black and white fish or was it one of those black and white fish? And that it's not quite as big a problem in the Caribbean where there's less biodiversity, but if you're in Raja Ampat or Indonesia, other parts of Indonesia or um, Fiji where there's just massive biodiversity, you come back to the boat and you try and look up a black and white fish, you're going you're gonna to be lost. So um, the other book that I recommend is, and this one is um, technically out of print, but sometimes you can find it used on Amazon, and it's called Coral Reef Fishes. And it's by Ewald Liskey and Robert Myers, and it's a Princeton Pocket Guides. And the reason this one is so good is because it's really small, it's really light, and it's the first front of the book is all the Atlantic coral fishes, and the second half of the book is all the Pacific coral reef fishes. So the coral reef fishes of the world in one small book is a, is a pretty good deal. Um, and the illustrations are just, I mean, they're spectacular. They're really, really good and very detailed. So those, this book I travel with all the time. It goes on every trip with me. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so anyway, so what I was saying is that um, these big clouds of chromis and antheus can be overwhelming if you want to try and learn what they are. But if, um, if you just spend a little time looking at shapes and, and differentiating between the two fish that are the most common in these clouds, which are the chromis and the antheus, and you understand that chromis and antheus are in the cloud just above the tips of the coral, whereas the other damselfish and chromis that aren't planktivores but are feeding on either little crustaceans or algae will be down in the branches of the coral. So that's what I was saying about understanding where the fish is and what it's doing will help you know what, what fish that is. Okay, so another trick is to um, understand, and we're back to damselfishes. So not a lot of people know this, but um, the anemone clownfish is a damselfish. And these um, uh, uh, decil humbug decilis are damselfish also. It's a kind of damselfish called a decilis. But interestingly, they both interact with their habitat in very similar ways. So most people know that um, clownfish are, uh, have a, a relationship with anemones, right? They hide inside the tentacles of the anemone and they don't get stung. And that's their preferred habitat for most clownfish, not all, but most. The humbug decilis has a very similar relationship with um, hard branching corals. They will hang out around the edge of the coral and when something gets too close or threatens them, first of all, they make an adorable squeaking noise, which if you haven't heard, I highly recommend. And then they dive into the branches of the coral. Now, the reason that's so interesting as a parallel behavior in understanding who these fish are and what they do is that both of these animals are anthozoans, meaning the, the anemone and this cauliflower coral are both anthozoans. And anthozoans um, are, uh, the, the Greek word is for flower, and they're related to each other and they both have stinging cells. So these fish are both relying on these anthozoans with these stinging cells to protect them in very similar ways. Um, so once you understand that some uh, damselfish have specific relationships with specific kinds of corals and anemones, then when you see a small colorful fish that's oval-ish shaped and it's darting in and out of anemones or corals, then you're starting to understand that oh, we're probably talking about some kind of damselfish here, which again, makes it easier to look up if you wanna get all the way down to species. But even if you don't look it up, you now understand the functioning once you've paid attention to these behaviors of damselfish on the reef and with the anemones. Okay, so the other habitats to pay attention to, as you can see my photo behind me here is um, seagrass and uh, mangroves, because I'm always encouraging people to dive or take the opportunity when it's presented to dive or snorkel in mangroves and seagrass because there's so much that you can see there that you might not get to see on the reef because it's a completely different habitat. So for instance, um, often you will see um, southern stingrays out over the seagrass and that's because um, they're feeding on um, crustaceans and shells and things that are buried in the sand. And again, if you think about the mouth placement, the mouth of a southern ray in many rays is um, uh, ventral, it's underneath. And that's because what they're feeding on is down in the sand. And then also, uh, this was in Raja Ampat, you can see um, in the seagrass, there are some uh, shrimp fish. And those, if you, you know, if you spend a little time really looking in and amongst seagrass blades, you can sometimes see some really unique and amazing fish. Shrimp fish are related to um, uh, uh, pipefish and seahorses. They're in the same family. And shrimp fishes are always sort of like trumpet, mini trumpet fish. They're always nose down. And in schools, they even swim around together nose down, which is quite a thing to see. So the other thing to note is behavior. So when you see a fish either for the first time or if you've seen it multiple times, if you can spend a little time with that fish, like I always tell people, if, if you wanna learn fish and understand fish, a slow dive is better. Because if you can pick one fish that you're particularly interested in and spend 
five to 10 minutes just watching it and not coming up on it. So back off a little and just kind of watch it. You will get to see it do some really amazing things. And those things will tell you a lot about what that fish is and what it's doing. Maybe it's um, having a mating behavior. Maybe it's laying eggs. Maybe it goes back to its nest. Maybe if it's a gardening damsel, it's tending its garden where it's killed the coral and the algae is growing. Uh, maybe it's feeding. Maybe it's going to a cleaning station. Um, so the more time you can spend watching individual fish, the more you'll learn about them. So for instance, this porcupine fish here, um, you'll often find them inside uh, a wreck or underneath a coral overhang. And that's because one, they're a pretty solitary fish for the most part, except during spawning season. And then they'll follow each other around in trains, crazy. Um, that happens a lot at Sugar Wreck in, um, in the Bahamas. But um, generally when it's not spawning time for them, they tend to be pretty solo and they are generally nocturnal. So during the day, you'll find them inside and underneath things like in, in this picture here. Also, fish with big eyes, um, like some squirrel fish um, and uh, this porcupine fish, that's often an indication that that's a nocturnal animal. So if you see a fish with big eyes, um, that might be an indicator that that's, that animal's preferred habitat is to be out at night. Um, also, again, with this porcupine fish, if you look at mouse shape, that's a very crushing mouth. You don't see any teeth, you see plates. And that's because they also feed on um, crustaceans and shells and things that they need to crush. So again, the mouth of a fish can tell you a lot about where you might find it and what it might be feeding on. Butterfly fish, you may know, um, tend to uh, swim around in pairs. So often if I see one butterfly fish, I'll stop and wait to make sure I see, find the other one <laughs> so that I'm not worried about it being alone. Um, and that's a, often a good way to tell a difference between um, sometimes in places where angelfish can be small, like flame angels and potter, potter's angels in Hawaii, and uh, where butterfly fish can be bigger, like pennant butterflies um, in, uh, in Indonesia. Sometimes uh, big butterfly fish and small angelfish can get confusing. Um, so one of the ways to tell is that butterfly fish are more often in pairs than angelfish. Are. And then we'll talk about another hint in the next slide. And then there's schooling behavior. So you see here in the mangrove, these little silver sides, um, bait fish tend to school and schooling is an anti-predator behavior. Um, the, the more you're in with your fellow fish, the less likely you are to be one to get struck by the predator. And it's also really interesting when you find a school of very young um, silver sides like this, especially up in the mangroves, sometimes you'll find um, young predators in with them too. So in in this particular location in Cuba, in this massive school of these silver sides, there were also hundreds of very small uh, juvenile barracuda. I mean, each barracuda was like this big. And I don't know if those barracuda were trying to school to protect themselves from bigger barracuda, or if they were trying to learn how to hunt these smaller silver sides. Uh, but uh, schooling, whether it's one species or multiple species, which you see you know, um, more than one species schooling together or sometimes even feeding together in a school, that's primarily for protection from predators. And then in this photo here, you see this little damselfish on top of this tower of coral. And that's a very common behavior for damsel, many damselfish, especially damselfish that garden. They will be highly territorial. So if you see a damselfish coming up over a sponge or up over a coral head and kind of coming towards you or a little fish coming towards you and going around in little circles and coming at you, that's a, that's a damselfish behavior. That's a damselfish being very, very territorial. Um, there aren't a whole lot of fish who do that. So here's a gimme. So everything else that we talked about um, was just an overview of the kinds of questions that you want to ask to learn more about fish as you're observing them as you're diving. So the main questions are, what shape is it? As we talked about, fish shape is a much better indicator of what that fish might be and also how it swims, behaves, and eats than color is. Colors, fish, colors of fish are not consistent and are a hard way to learn what a fish is for the first time. Um, so what shape is it? Where is it? 
what habitat did I see it in? And within that habitat, where was it? Was it above the coral? Was it up high in the water column? Was it hiding inside the coral? Was it associated with an anemone? That's the second important question. And then the last question is behavior. What was it doing? Um, so those three questions will always help you better understand what fish you're looking at and what its place is in, in the reef. And the more you come to understand that, I believe the more enjoyable your dive because you'll come to understand everything that's happening around you. A, a reef or a seagrass bed or a mangrove is like a little city. There's a million little things and interactions going on. And the more you have an understanding of those, the more fascinating a dive can be. So here's a couple of just straight up gimmies if you didn't know them. So like I said, sometimes angelfish and butterfly fish can be confusing. They're colorful. Sometimes they can be in the mid ranges. They can be similar sizes. Um, so other than the pairing aspect that we talked about with butterfly fish, angelfish always, always, every single angelfish in the world has this opercular spine. Now it's not always in exactly that spot, but that covering over the gill is called the opercular and there will be a spine somewhere on it. Now initially the, it can be hard to see the spine, but once you get a search pattern for it and you start looking for it, you'll be able to see it right away. And that's, you. In, if it doesn't have it, it's not an angelfish. If it does have it, it is an angelfish. And then the other give me is with parrotfishes. So parrotfishes um, always swim with this little flappy pectoral movement that's kind of awkward looking, like flying kind of. Um, and they really only use their tail for bursts of speed. So most of the time when they're just kind of cruising around, um, grazing on coral or defending a territory, which this one was from this uh, uh, Moorish idol, uh, they will just be using their pectoral fins to kind of maneuver and, and fly. Um, so if you see a fish doing that, it is either a parrotfish or a wrasse because wrasse do that also. But then you can tell the difference between parrotfish and wrasse because parrotfish have that parrot beak and wrasse have little fangs. Um, so that's a gimme too. You will now always know whether you're seeing a parrotfish or a wrasse and you'll always know when you're seeing an angelfish. And there's a lot of other tips and tricks like that too that you can, you can get to and layer on top of the learning about those three big questions that we talked about. What shape is the fish? Um, where is it? What is its habitat? And what is it actually doing? Um, and keep in mind that, as we said, one of the most interesting and important parts about a ship's ship, a fish's shape is its mouth. So, um, and then I just wanted to give a plug to the Sea of Change Foundation. Um, that The Sea of Change Foundation is the conservation nonprofit of choice that is supported by uh, Aggressor Adventures. Um, I'm honored to be the Director of Conservation Outreach for an amazing foundation. 100% of funds raised goes directly to um, conservation projects around the world. Uh, the Sea of Change Foundation um, mission is to fund research initiatives that directly impact the natural world we love to enjoy and explore. And our mission is to create positive change every day for our oceans and also on land. Um, so uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Sea of Change Foundation, I encourage you to go to our website, or you can also email me anytime with any questions or suggestions about that or about fish. I love talking about fish and teaching about fish and about corals also, so I'm always available. And with that, I would like to thank you and know if you have any additional questions or thoughts. Right. Great job, Sam. <clears throat> uh, we do have a couple of um, questions. I will say I just did put a link for the Sea of Change Foundation in the chat box. So if you guys want to learn more or if you feel uh, obligated to donate, we'd greatly appreciate it. You can check that out today. So, uh, Sam, we do have a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, uh, John wants to ask if there's any good fish ID apps out there that you know about. Mm. Not that I know of, but I'm not, I'm not 100% an app girl either. I mean, I have, I have a, a bird ID app through Cornell that I think is phenomenal. Um, but I, because a lot of, yeah, I can't, I can't recommend one because I don't really use them. There might be an excellent one out there. I haven't heard of it if there is. 
if someone were to ask me what I recommend to really learn fish, I would really recommend traveling with these with these two books um, be, because even with the best app, you're not going to have the ability to cross reference and the descriptions here um, are short but very telling of, and they're not overly scientific, but it really tells you what you need to know about the fish to understand it so that next time you see the fish, you know what it is and what it's doing. So that may sound a little old school, but that's really what I would recommend. I was going to say, she's old school. She likes to take the book. I do. Let's and see. it's also, it's also, it's really, it's kind of a communal thing. You know, when you come back from a dive and everybody's looking at their photos and trying to identify their fish and you, you know, you whip out your, you know, you look at it and you're like, I'm not sure, you know, let me look at it. And everybody whips out their books and, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's more fun than passing a phone around, I feel like. Um, and the, the other thing that I was going to talk about too, but I just didn't want to go too long is that, and I had a slide, but I'll just describe it. It's important to understand when you're looking at a fish shape, to understand what that fish is doing. So for example, when I was in Raja Ampat the first time, I thought I discovered a new species of eel because I was above it looking down. And I didn't realize until I looked at the photo later that the eel was at a cleaning station. So it had its gill plates open and it was having its gills clean. But from the top, it looked like an eel with like this massive head. And I couldn't find it in the books. I'd never heard of an eel like that. And it took about 25 minutes of really zooming in and looking at the picture to realize that the eel was in a cleaning station and that it had its gills flared. So totally be aware of that too. Okay. Um, we do have one question I can answer. Uh, Sandra uh, wants to know if we can view this, this talk later. She missed the beginning, I'm supposing. Yes, everyone, you will be able to see this video tomorrow. Um, first thing in the morning, we'll, we'll have it on the website at uh, aggressor.com. Uh, let me actually send you over the Zoom link itself. Uh, that will come to you here in a second in the chat. Um, let's see. Can I get the names of the authors of that reef fish book, Samantha? Uh, both of them? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the First one is by Paul Human. The last name is spelled H-U-M-A-N-N. -N. And Ned Deloche. Last name is spelled D-E-L-O-A-C-H. And this one, which again, I'm sorry, it can be hard to find, but if you find it, grab it. Um, it the authors are Ewald, E-W-A-L-D, Lieske, L-I-E-S-K-E. And the other author is Robert Myers. Last name is spelled M-Y-E-R-S. Okay. Um, and this one's good because it has both the Atlantic and the Pacific in it. Oh, cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what a lateral line is and what its function is? Sure. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so a lateral line is um, it's sometimes called like the sixth sense in fishes. And you can see it in, let me see if I have a picture that shows it, hold on. I don't know if I do. Well, yeah, you can see it there in the jacks, that line right down the center of the body, that's where the lateral line would be in, that, in those jacks. And then, uh, tiger shark, yeah, you can sort of see it in the tiger shark, um, the line that sort of, bisects the body from the dorsal top to the ventral bottom. And so what the lateral line does is it picks up vibrations in the, in the water to a very, very sensitive degree. And it's why when you, see, um, when you see fish school and you see them able to absolutely move in completely in unison without bumping into each other, it's because they're sensing each other's pressure waves that they're making as they move through the water with their lateral lines. So they can sense how far apart and how close they are and when one is starting to move or the whole school is starting to move. That's what, that's what a lateral line is. It's, ama it's amazing. I wish I had one. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, okay, I think we have one more here. Uh, are there certain gen genesis of fish that are, are more likely to be endemics in warm water? 
genus of fish that are more likely to be endemic to warmer waters. Is that the question? Yes. Okay. So endemic means that that fish um, is found only there and nowhere else. And endemism is related, is correlated with um, uh, water temperatures. So let's say you have um, a potter's angel or flame angel is endemic to Hawaii. It's only found in Hawaii and only at certain depths. So that, that, that striation in the water where that temperature is, is probably important for that flame angel, which is why it's found only there. But it, yeah. I think that's the best exp I think that's the best explanation. Temperature is part of what defines endemism for fish that are endemic. Okay. Uh, after shape, what is the most useful physical feature to look for? Um, it probably probably um, tail. It's again, it's a shape thing, but. Um, tail is really indicative in a lot of fish. So there's a lot of different shapes that tails, I'm sorry to go back to shape, but um, there's a lot of different shapes that tails can be. They can be sickle shaped or scissor shaped or, or spade shaped. And um, those tail shapes can really, if you're stuck and you can't decide between um, two fishes that seem very, very similar in shape and behavior and color, often if you then go, all right, well, let's compare either the tails or sometimes it's also the pectoral, not the pectoral fins, the anal fins, those will be distinctly different enough to be able to tell the difference between the two fish. Um, that, yeah, that's what I would, I would start with overall fish shape to identify a fish and then once you define what that shape is and where you saw that fish, then go to another distinguishing characteristic like tail or like the spine on the operculum and leave color like third. Because in places like the Caribbean, you can rely on color a little bit more because there isn't as much biodiversity. But if you go to someplace like Raja Ampat and you start trying to identify things by color, you're you're going to be lost really quickly because there's so, there's so much and there's so many colors of so many things <laughs> is uh what is the effect of our bright lights on fish um there's a lot of debate about that um i mean honestly nothing no nothing with eyes likes to have anything flashed in them i don't like it you don't like it manatees don't like it dogs don't like it horses don't like it fish don't like it um, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's unnerving. Um, so I would say that a, a bright light could spook a fish. Does it have any long-term negative impact? Probably not. I mean, I would be a little bit concerned about very deep water fish or highly nocturnal fish that hardly ever come out. Um, light might, they might be more, that those species might be more sensitive to light. Um, but I mean, I would have to dig into the science. Actually, I have a friend who studied vision in fish. Um, I could ask her. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's just the, you know, really the precautionary principle. No, no animal wants to be dis overly disturbed. I mean, I think you can take your photo. Uh, I just wouldn't, you know, flash a thousand times in the face of a, a puffer fish that's, you know, asleep during the day or, uh, you know, a, a parrot fish that's in its sleeping mucus cocoon, you know, take your one or two photos with a flash and then carry on kind of thing. Sure. Okay. Well, I think that wraps us up. Great job, Sam. Thanks. Uh, so uh, we're going to go ahead and read you guys the schedule for our upcoming calls. On May 26th, we have Kristen Vallette Worth with uh, Patty. On Wednesday, the, May 27th, we have Captain Scott Arney from Palau. And that's going to be a very good uh, presentation. We walked through it the other day. I'm very excited. Uh, and then June 2nd, we have Andit's Kalpasaro from Cocos Island. And uh, we have a couple more in the works, guys. So I hope uh, you guys come back and join us. And I hope you guys have a great rest of, rest of your week. See you under the water. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sam. Bye.